So in the last video, we saw that, you know, really now um, block producers have two sources of rewards. So first of all, there's the block reward, and then second of all, uh, you know, which are newly minted coins generally, and then there's the transaction fees, which are transfers from the creators of the transactions that get included in the block. And we talked about how those two sources of rewards really are conceptually quite different in a number of different ways. Um, so one question you might have is, you know, uh, which of these is sort of bigger than the other? Like, should you think of block rewards as being the dominant term or transaction fees being the dominant term or what? Well, historically, you know, for most of the history of blockchains, um, block rewards have been quite a bit bigger than transaction fees. So for the Bitcoin blockchain, this has literally always been true. It's very unusual to see a block where the, the total value of the transaction fees is, say, at least 20% of the block reward. Uh, and it's not very unusual to see blocks where the transaction fees are, say, at most 5% of the block rewards. So really, you know, to first order um, for Bitcoin miners, uh, almost all of the revenue is coming from the block rewards. Ethereum is a little bit more interesting to talk about. So for, for the first several years of Ethereum's existence, the same fact was true. Transaction fees were dwarfed um, by the value of the block reward. But that has been, you know, not so true for the last, I don't know, year, year and a half or something, uh, especially since the rise of decentralized finance, DeFi, which we'll talk about later in the lecture series. Uh, so the demand for the Ethereum blockchain uh, as of late has been quite high and transaction fees have therefore been quite high. In fact, it's not that uncommon to see a block on Ethereum where the, the amount of uh, reward that the miner gets from transaction fees actually exceeds uh, the two Ether that they got uh, for the block reward. Now, it's by no means true in every block or even necessarily on average, you know, but on average, transaction fees are quite high. You would definitely not say that block rewards dominate transaction fees uh, in Ethereum in 2020 or 2021. So if we try to project into the future, right, I mean, in Ethereum, we've just seen this like increasing demand um, for computation on the Ethereum blockchain. And so if that continues, you know, depending on what happens with the coin price of Ether, um, but if that continues, it could be that eventually transaction fees actually dwarf the black rewards uh, in Ethereum if demand continues to sort of skyrocket at the rate that it has been. And actually, similarly in Bitcoin, even though the transaction fees, um, you know, for the entire existence of the protocol have been low relative to the block rewards, it's also conceivable that could change in the future, even if the demand for the Bitcoin protocol doesn't actually increase that much. Uh, and that's because actually, you know, while the block reward in Bitcoin right now is 6.25 Bitcoins, that has not always been true and will not always be true in the future. Right, so when the protocol was first launched, uh, the block reward was 50 Bitcoins, then it got cut to 25, then to 12 and a half, and now it's six and a quarter. So once every four years, there's a halving event, um, and this is sort of hard-coded into the, into the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, the periodically, every four years, the block reward literally just gets cut uh, in half. And eventually, if Bitcoin's still around in ballpark the year 2140, the block rewards will actually simply be zero. So project far out enough in the future, it will also be true that eventually in Bitcoin, you might expect transaction fees uh, to dominate the block rewards. And in fact, if this does happen, okay, if transaction fees at some point start dwarfing block rewards, that actually could be a problem. And in particular, what I want to point out on this slide is that actually uh, the selfish mining um, attacks, the deliberate forking attacks we talked about last lecture, actually could get a lot worse once you have very large transaction fees. And to give credit where credit is due, this issue is discussed uh, at length in a paper, actually all the way back in 2016, um, by Carlston, uh, Kaladner, Weinberg, and Narayanan. So let me just help you page back in sort of the relevant points from last lecture, from lecture 10, uh, about selfish mining. So the point of selfish mining is to sort of deliberately uh, create forks, deliberately try to orphan blocks in order to boost the, re the rewards that you're getting from the protocol. And what we learned last lecture is that whether or not, you know, this can be done profitably depends on a couple assumptions. So first of all, there's a question of when there's a tie in the longest chain, uh, what assumptions do you make about what honest nodes do? And what we saw is that if you assume sort of worst case tie breaking, so if the attacker can actually pick how the honest nodes tie break between uh, competing longest chains, then in fact, even for a very small attacker, even with an attacker with say only an alpha equal 1% 1, 1 uh, of the hash rate, even then it's actually beneficial uh, to do these deliberate forking attacks. 
On the other hand, you know, you could think about the case where honest blocks always break ties in favor of honestly produced blocks. So a longest chain that has an honest block at the end of it, that's kind of the best case um, as far as defeating the attacker. Uh, and there we saw that actually selfish mining doesn't help if alpha is small, but if you have an attacker with more than a third of the hash rates, it's still the case, even with this kind of best case tie breaking, um, that selfish mining can help. So what I want to show you here in this example, I want to now consider uh, large transaction fees. And I want to show you that even if you have best case tie breaking, okay, so even if honest nodes always break ties between longest chains in favor of those where the last block was honestly produced, and even if the attacker is small, right, if it has alpha equal 1% of the hash rate, even then, when you have large transaction fees, there will be situations where it's in that miner's interest uh, to launch a selfish mining attack, to try to uh, orphan uh, the last block on the longest chain. So the easiest way to see this is with an example. Uh, so suppose we're in a world where actually transaction fees are really big. Let's say that in sort of a typical block, the total value of the transaction fees is 10x the value of the block reward. And of course, as usual, you know, the block reward is sort of steady and protocol computed. The transaction fees are going to rise and fall with demand. So sometimes they'll be super high. Sometimes they'll be, you know, lower than average. And but let's assume that even on average, you have 10x the transaction fees uh, as you do the block reward. Now imagine, you know, the protocol, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, is just sort of humming along, adding blocks to the longest chain, these blocks that have lots of transaction fees as part of them. Uh, and now imagine sort of the most recent block added to the end of the longest chain has not just typically high transaction fees, but like super high transaction fees. Let's say they're 10x times the average transaction fees, which would make it 100x times the block reward. Now suppose you're a miner, right? What are you, you going to do? Um, well, if you're honest, it's clear what you'd do. If you're honest, you're supposed to mine on the end of this block B3. Uh, and then this block with super high transaction fees would be more deeply embedded, embedded into the longest chain. Uh, however, given that these transaction fees are so high, so much higher than average and so much higher than the block reward, it sure is tempting to, instead of trying to extend B3, try to extend uh, B2 and basically steal those super high transaction fees for yourself. So literally just try to mine a copy of B3, of course, with your public key as the miner, as opposed to, to the real B3, um, but just mine a copy of B3 uh, that again has B2 as its predecessor. So suppose you've got, I don't know, alpha equals 20% of the hash rate, something like that, right? So then, you know, there's a one in five chance that you're the next one to produce a block. Uh, and so if you're doing this forking attack, that in that event, in that one in five chance, you will be producing this orange block B3 prime, uh, which is um, extending B2. Now, you haven't necessarily orphaned the original B3 at this point. Uh, if we were assuming that this orange node also got to choose you know, also got to control which of these two branches other nodes were going to extend, then actually it would be done because it would just sort of force by whatever means other nodes to extend B3 prime rather than B3. But the point is that, you know, even under sort of, you know, best case honest tie breaking, okay, where all nodes are going to, in this, in this case, try to extend B3 rather than the newer block B3 prime, there's still a one in five chance that the orange attacker is also going to be finding the very next block, which will be some B4 prime extending its previous block B3 prime. And let's say that B4 prime again just has sort of the average uh, large amount of transaction fees. So the orange attacker, right, they can do this. There is some risk involved, right? So if they successfully mine B3 prime, but they don't then immediately mine B4 prime, and instead some other node mines a B4 extending B3, well then, you know, the orange attacker sort of wasted one of the nodes. So it has to forego, you know, the block reward and transaction fees it could have otherwise obtained had it just honestly tried to extend B3 rather than fork off B3. However, you know, so four out of five times, you're going to wind up regretting trying to do this attack because you're going to lose the revenue you would have made from your first orange block. But one in five times, you're going to do really, really well. You're going to hit the jackpot. You're going to successfully orphan B3. You will take those super high transaction fees for yourself. And so if you have 20% of the hash rate and those transaction fees in B3 are 10x normal, this is totally worth it. It's totally worth the risk. The expected benefit uh, outweighs the expected uh, lost rewards of a failed attack. So in general, the punchline is that, you know, no matter how small you are, no matter how small your hash rate alpha, even if it's like 1% or something, uh, there may be situations where it makes sense to launch this selfish mining attack. If there's ever a block where the transaction fees 
are much, much, much higher than the average reward you get from a block, meaning the combined block reward plus transaction fees in a typical block. If you ever have these particular super high value blocks, even if you're a very kind of a small um, node, it still maximizes expected reward to try to do this orange fork as opposed to honestly extending the blue chain. And this is frankly not good. You, you actually do not want block producers to have these kinds of incentives, right? In the extreme case, if all you had were different block producers, you know, trying to fork each other, trying to steal each other's rewards, you know, progress in the blockchain would slow to a crawl. You might even just lose liveness if literally all miners are trying to sort of fork each other off as opposed to uh, extend the longest chain. Now, in Bitcoin, you know, I'd be surprised if these kinds of selfish mining attacks became an issue anytime uh, soon. The reason being that to, up to this point, quite consistently, uh, transaction fees have been dominated by the block reward uh, in Bitcoin. And if you think about it, this attack doesn't make sense if the transaction fees are small relative to the block reward. Because right? basically, when you have a failed attack, you lose the block reward that you would have gotten from B3 Prime had you instead tried to actually honestly extend the longest chain. It's true there'll be cases where you get the extra transaction fees when you successfully do the B4 prime, but that's not going to be enough to make up for the lost block reward in the cases where your attack fails. Okay, that's if the transaction fees are dominated by block rewards. So that's been true in Bitcoin up to this point, so there isn't really much of an incentive to launch this kind of attack. Uh, but again, you know, Bitcoin uh, rewards are getting cut in half in BTC terms, in, in, in the native currency terms, every four years. So eventually the Brock rewards will get really small, and by 2140, uh, they're supposed to go to zero. So if nothing else, at that point, the transaction fees will be dominating uh, the block rewards in Bitcoin, if Bitcoin's still around in 2140, um, and you would expect this to be an issue at that time, if not earlier. Ethereum, meanwhile, you know, it's not actually clear it's so far from the regime where these kinds of attacks um, might uh, make sense. So we'll talk about this more in our DeFi lectures, but you know, there are certain transactions in Ethereum which are very, very, very valuable. So I will be definitely monitoring carefully uh, whether or not you see any, anything that, whether we see anything that resembles these kinds of you know, deliberate forking attacks to steal transaction fees uh, in Ethereum uh, going forward. Now, interestingly, the transaction fee mechanism we're going to talk about in the next video, the transaction fee mechanism introduced in EIP-1559, which is used uh, in Ethereum today, um, a byproduct of that design is it actually makes this selfish mining attack uh, less severe. And the reason is because, as you'll see in that design, we're going to be burning some of the transaction fees. Uh, so the amount of the transaction fees that go to the miner is going to be smaller. And so that means there's less incentive to do these kinds of uh, deliberate forking attacks. That doesn't mean this problem completely goes away, but the new transaction fee mechanism in Ethereum actually does mitigate uh, the issue that we're seeing uh, on this slide. That's not at all the primary motivation for the, for the switch to the new transaction fee mechanism. It's just kind of a, a sort of happy byproduct. Uh, so in the next video, let's start talking squarely about, you know, what's wrong with first price options? Why would you want to do anything different? You know, and what are the key ideas in EIP 1559 for doing better? So I'll see you there.